Good afternoon. Welcome to eSIMS Engineering. Uh, this video is a lesson on activity 213, and we're basically just going to go to go through all of the different commands and styles um, within our virtual machines that you'll be using for 213. Now, I just want to note that for 213, uh, most teachers are just going to ask you to answer the questions that are encompassed in, uh, in this activity, but I want to obviously uh, go over how you interact with the virtual machine that you're using for this. So what I've done here is this, this um, set up, I've just increased the size of my bash terminal and also over here I have my directory tree which has the uh, the repository, the mercurial repository that copied over from the assignment. So 214, 221, 222, 223, these represent files that you'll be using in those assignments. And remember ultimately this will become a web server and we're also going to use it to demonstrate a couple of client and server side applications for the following unit. So this virtual machine will come in handy for a couple of activities. So in this assignment, we're just going to kind of go over what the commands are and how to use them and how to use the virtual machine so you can see it in action. So um, we're going to skip over this first part here, which you kind of look up some things because you can use the do this on your own. That's not what I'm here for. I'm not even going to go over uh, the concept of a TCP IP handshake about what happens between those two, um, the different symbols and things. I'm going to start right at part number three, scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. I'm going to go right at part number three, which starts at number 11. So we've got our workspace open. And uh, remember that this workspace is just kind of, it's kind of like Canopy, except that instead of it being a command prompt for Python, it's a command prompt for a computer, a hypothetical computer. That's why it's called a virtual machine. So it has what's called a command line interface, or CLI. And again, remember, we have vocab words. We can always click the vocab word in our uh, ink docs, inklings, uh, uh, sorry, ink docs. Um, to read what the definition of that is. So it's a prompt that usually uh, uses immediate execution. So what we do is, whatever we type in here, we press enter, we're telling the, the computer to read the command and execute that command and then print the output and then do it again. Uh, it's called a REPL, a read execute print loop. Um, IPython interactive session is also a REPL. Now, um, in this case, we are going to use the command line prompt. We're going to use this to get some bits of information about the internet. And you can see some of the stuff that I just had previously as well. So, uh, for example, if I type in here, who am I? I can tell the, this is basically what user is currently logged into the machine. Now, Ubuntu is a global user that is assigned to your machine, assuming you have not made your own login. So if you, for some reason, have already made a login for this virtual machine, you should be, you, you may get a different output for the who am I command. And if you type PWD, that is the print working directory command, PWD. So that's the uh, working directory on the machine that we are using. Okay, so uh, a lot of vocab in that section. Definitely take time to kind of learn about what all these vocab words mean. They may ask you questions about them. Uh, some of them you'll recognize from when we did them back in uh, Unit 1. So let's take a look at this. We're going to examine how the network interfacing card gets you onto the Internet. Now, we're going to use the following commands to check IP numbers and use a couple of different commands to test latency and see how things happen. So we're going to use all these commands, and we're just going to kind of follow along with what we're going to do. Uh, I said NIC, a network interface card, uh, in case you're not sure what that is. Basically, it's a piece of hardware in your computer that allows you to connect to the network. If you think about, if you have an Ethernet connection on the computer you're using right now, that, uh, that, that's the card, that's the Ethernet card that is, be, that is being used to interface with the Internet on your, on your, uh, for your computer to interface with the Internet. So uh, it, is use, it uses the uh, IP, and, IP address and system administrator rights to, to do that. On Windows, you actually can type in IP config in a command prompt window, and it will tell you the same information that you're about to get when you type here on the IF config. Now, I do want to point out that if we type in IF config and we hit enter, the addresses and information that we get from this, this actually is a, uh, there's actually two different outputs from this, and we're going to explain what those two are. So I just typed in IF config. We're going to be told to type in IF config, which is right here, number 14. Um, and we can use the mouse wheel. I have it happen to happen to have it all scrolled up on here. Uh, we're going to get two different NICs that are described. So we get ETH 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 zero ETH zero uh, Ethernet zero. And that's this computer, the actual computer I'm recording on right now, uh, the Ethernet card. And the LO is what's called the loopback device, and that basically is a hypothetical network card that I can use to send packets to myself for uh, educational purposes. In this case, so it doesn't exist. It's basically something out of the out of the virtual machine that allows us to, to do that. So we do have, you'll see, an IP address. We have an INET address. We have a MAC address. Um, we have. We're going to talk about what those all are in just a second. And then the loop out the loop 
back machine also has its own IP address as well. Um, three bits of information that we can get from this from this information. Well, that's what we kind of just said already. Uh, the data on the internet is always sent in numbered packets from one IP address to another IP address. Version four of the IP address protocol uses dotted decimal, four decimals between zero and 255 separated by dot. So you can see here is the IP address on Ethernet zero, 172.17080. That is an IPv4 address because it's using that same notation that we just mentioned uh, in this problem. So that's the first thing. The second thing you want to notice is the media access control address or MAC address. And as, the, as it points out here, there's no relationship to Macintosh computers. Uh, that is something that's built into your card hardware when it's manufactured. It's, it's kind of like a serial number in that regard. And it's basically uh, used to send information from the actual cards and actual devices from one, from one point to the next. So the MAC address is a six digit hexadecimal uh, system here. So if you'll look here, this right here appears to be the MAC address of the Ethernet card. And then notice that the virtual, the loopback, does not have a MAC address, which makes sense because it's not a physical piece of piece of hardware. Uh, each MAC address is two is six digits uh, that already was MAC address of that. Um, Remember, we talked about why you can only have this many addresses with IPv4. Eventually, it will go to IPv6. Um, IPv6 are written in colon hexadecimal notation like a MAC address. Okay, uh, This machine does not, this one does have a, yes, I'm looking at it right there, INET6. This is the, uh, right here, the uh, IPv6 address. Um, the output above shows the Ethernet uh, has an IPv6 address, such as that, FE80. Or two ACFF FE on fifth one set so that's actually this right here uh, is the whole is the whole thing so my I, inet six address is very similar to the output that's given here. Okay, now the next thing we're going to look up is we're going to look at the domain name system and we're going to use that to look up IP addresses. Okay, your web browser usually talks to the domain name system without you even knowing, but you can access the system directly on Windows and Unix like machines. The NS lookup command will ask your recursive name server to get the IP address assigned to a domain domain name. So I could use any website I want. I can look up pltw.org here as an example. Um, we can do that. So if I type in NS lookup www.pltw.org into my um, into my browser, into my virtual machine, I will get that information right here. I get a server IP address, I get a regular uh, address, we'll talk about that in a second, and then I get a non-authoritative answer for the different web servers. If I tried a different website, if I did ESPN.com, for example, I could get very similar uh, output, but this time just for ESPN.com, and you see we got some non-authoritative answers, we got the server main IP address, and so forth. Now again, this right here, I just want to point out, you'll notice that the server and address are the same in both instances. Now remember, what we're looking at here is we're looking at the DNS server. The DNS server's IP address is that. And the information that we're asking for it is what is the what is the IP addresses for the website or host that we are asking about. So for example, in the first one, we looked up pltw.org. Here we looked up ESPN.com and we got notice that we got two different addresses, uh, two different outputs for that we have. And the difference between this is the second digit right here. And then here we've got a couple of different addresses on here. And that builds redundancy. We talked about redundancy back in 212. When you have more machines that are capable of doing the exact same thing, if one of them breaks down, you don't have to worry so much because the others will be able to pick up the slack. Okay, so let's go ahead Let's talk about the next thing. All right, so I kind of just mentioned, what I just mentioned is kind of the same thing with this paragraph here. So you can read that on your own. Um, DNS reports to IP addresses for, for pltw.org. Redundancy is like having two machines ready to respond to a web request, make the system resilient or robust. Two are described as software and systems that are resistant to failure. So number 17, you basically can look up another one of your favorite web page, whatever you want for that, and just record the information that you get from that. So you would use the same idea with a different website, and then what do you get out of that? Now, to see the, the work that the authoritative DNS servers do, we're going to use the dig command, which stands for Domain Information Groper. And we're, the, we're also going to add the plus trace option as below. And what this does is we get a lot more output. Let's go ahead and try it with the pltw.org uh, website. We can try that here. So we'll do dig www.pltw.org, and we're going to add the trace command. Now, notice that woo, when I press that, we get quite a bit of information out of that. The much There's much more here. What happens within this... Um, and we're kind of follow the logic here. Let me kind of bring this over so we can see that. Um, what happens is when you do a dig command, it's going to keep track of all of the different requests that are made and to where they've been made to get the information that you're looking for. 
So the recursive DNS server first reports the domain name to one or more root servers. So here's the root servers. We have a.rootservers.net, b.rootservers.net, all the way down to m.rootservers.net. And then we end up getting a signature, returning signature here, okay? It looks up that, that their DNS server reports the domain name of one or more of the root servers. So here's the root servers that the information is telling us. And then it's gonna go to the .org name server and it's going to pull uh, name server lookup information. Here's the servers it's looking for, okay? The recursive server asks one of the root servers for the IP address of this website, right? The root DNS server responds with the domain names and IP addresses for the .org name servers. So see here, we're looking for, hey, we're looking for a .org website. Okay, that's what these tell you. All right, here's the, some .org name servers that we're looking, have the information we need. Okay, the next thing, it, then the next thing it does is it looks to other name servers while the A record above finally gives this address. Okay, so here is the other information, here's the next source of information is here's the pltw.org name server information. This is the jake.ns.cloudflare and gene.ns.cloudflare.com. This is the servers that we're basically getting the IP addresses from that we would have to go to to go to pltw.org. So, and I'm, you know, I'm just curious. I'm going to try this here just to see if this works. If I type in this address as an IP address, 104.2, I'm going to just try this. I'm just curious, okay? And I'm curious here while I'm recording this. I'm going to take that and I'm going to put it into a web browser. I just want to see if it comes up. No, we can't do a direct IP address. Okay, fine, 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 fine. All right, I was just curious to see if that would actually work. We'd have to access it the traditional way, and that's okay. All right, so how many separate machines are on the serving DNS loop for the top level .org uh, domain server? So if I look in here, if I, this is not, remember, this is not the .org name server here. This is the .org name server. So we end up with one, two, three, four, five, six different sites that are serving the .org name server, right? So that's that. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to measure latency and bandwidth. Now, this is important. If you don't read enough information, you're going to get stuck here. You're going to ask your teacher, help, I can't get out of this, whatever. Um, when you use the ping command, the ping command continues indefinitely until you tell it to stop. Okay? So if I type in ping, we'll use pltw.org again, right? If I ping pltw.org, it's going to keep pinging pltw.org and it's gonna keep reporting what that time it takes. So it's taking 10.4 milliseconds for the information from my machine to jump over to the server at PLTW and then back to my machine. So that's that's very little, little, little bit of time, right? But notice it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. You're gonna be like, oh, what do I have to do? I have to close my bash terminal? No, you have to interrupt the command by pressing Control C. And when you do that, then you can get, it'll give you all that information. There's no packet loss, time it took, how many packets were transmitted, how many packets were received. You get all the information from the ping command. You just have to tell it to stop. And the way you do that is with, pro, with pressing control C, okay? And you're gonna say, well, how am I supposed to know that? Again, read the paragraph that you have here and it will show you this is the paragraph that you want. That'll tell you what you're looking for. How long to take round trips where the packets are dropped. Use control C to kill this ping process. Such a friendly word, right? Okay, so answer some questions about that concept defined here, latency and bandwidth, two different but very similar uh, concepts that sometimes are, are confused and, and meshed into one. They're not the same thing, okay? So do pay attention to that. Uh, this one asks you to go to a speedtest.net site. I'll let you kind of do that. That's not too hard to do. And then the last thing that you do through here is you use the whatsmyip.org information to identify the IP address of your computer. Now, the command that you're using here is what's called trace path. Now trace path allows you to basically follow the path of a packet from a server to your computer or vice versa, depending on what, uh, what commands you throw into this. In order to get this to work, you have to type in these two commands one at a time into your virtual machine. I'm not gonna do it because I've already done it on mine, but you just have to do that once and then do that one once and then that will allow you to use the trace path command here, okay? So I'm gonna execute the trace path command and I'm going to uh, use the IP address in this IP address instead of an example below. So I'm gonna use the IP address that I had before when I did the, um, uh, did do what was it? The IF config command, right? So I just have to, I'm gonna get my IP address from that. I know I could just use what's my IP to get the same information, but I'm gonna try just using this INET address. Okay, so let's try it. Trace path 172.17.0.80, right? Okay, 
And the reason why it hops right, right to it is because it's the machine that I'm using. Uh, if I want to use the network card on here, let's try a different one. Let's try, the, let's try the actual IP address. Okay, so we'll try it here. This is the IP address that I just went to, and I went to that by looking at the whatsmyip.org uh, website. So I didn't skip that. If I press enter here, you'll notice that now I get a few more. It's going to continue. It's going to be looking for those. And then notice here's the uh, local host right there. Some more information. And we're kind of getting here. See, look how these are different IP addresses that, the, that my, my trace path is going through to get from one place to another. And it's timing that and reporting back IP addresses as well. So if it makes five hops and there's no reply, it should stop soon. Um, it's just checking right now. Um, still going. <laughs> And I'll just pause, we'll, we'll let, let the rest of it execute. Okay, so it went a pretty good amount of time there noticing that we didn't get a reply after 30 hops all the way up to, from 10 to 30. So unfortunately, no additional IP addresses were grabbed out of here. But here is a good information, right? We actually, the one other thing that you're going to do, this is sort of the last thing for my own students that they're, they're going to do, is they're going to basically take this map and they're going to um, draw a sort of a path at where where the where the um, packets had gone from when they did this trace path command, so you would have to type in this IP address, and you would use it in a website called IPLocation.net. So if you go to IPLocation.net, IPLocation.net, and I type any of those IP addresses into, let's grab, let's say for example, grab this one right here. Let's grab that, copy that, and if I type in that IP address here, let me do a little extra space there, and I look up, IP lookup, and then it will tell me that this particular IP address is in Seattle, Washington, right? So there's there's a good example of that. And it also gives a geolocation as well, and latitude and longitude, which is kind of cool as well. So that's kind of what you'd have to do from that. You'd have to use all the different IP addresses that you would get from that, and then that would allow you to fill out this map. Okay. All right. So that's it. That's a good tutorial right there on how to use the virtual machine for 213. I'll be back soon with a tutorial on 214 on how to use your machine as a web server. And again, don't forget, subscribe to eSIMS Engineering. And I also would love if you'd like this video, if you really enjoyed the tutorial and you learned something new. Hope you have a wonderful day. Don't forget to be awesome.